let me begin by a retractation. Again, I guess I've done this about a hundred times. This is a, a minor one, but um, it brings up an important point, as usual. Last time I had brought up the famous catalog of ships at the end of book two, and uh, we had both commented on the importance of this and the, and the wonder of it, really. And just pulling a, a name out of my, my memory without thinking about who he was or anything, just a name, I said, for example, uh, Deiphobus, but of course he's not mentioned in the catalog anywhere. <clears throat> for one thing, of course, he's a, he's a Greek, he's one of the sons of Priam, I mean, he's a Trojan, one of the sons of Priam, and uh, most of the names given in the, in the catalog are Greek. The Trojans are given a shorter one, but after all, they didn't have such a vast uh, armies. Uh, the, the Trojans depended upon the walls primarily for their defense, and their numbers were smaller. But it does bring up this great question of error. Uh, these are not scholarly discourses that we're embarked on, in case you might not, not have known by now. Those of you uh, who, who <laughs> noticed that Deiphobus <laughs> is not among those listed in the catalog of ships. <laughs> For those of you who tuned in late, we might, we might repeat that these are our conversations and that we believe and we believe it's very important that um, conversations uh, are the best way to talk, uh, the best way to study, if you will, uh, this uh, great subject uh, of poetry that we're uh, embarked on. That is, uh, poetry is the, uh, the music of love. It's the it's the food of love, and. Uh, a conversation is a way of talking about poetry. Uh, the minute you get into uh, any of the other modes of discourse, you begin to lose it. You, you, you might put it this way, uh, people who are too observant and who take notes on things don't really see them. Objectivity itself is a kind of absence. Uh, the minute you get objective about something and you begin to think about it in a scientific way, you've already uh, removed yourself by definition. You, you have to remove yourself from it in order to observe it, preferably through a microscope or through, through some kind of an instrument. Uh, otherwise, the scientists would say, you lose your objectivity if you get involved. Well, poetry is something that you have to get involved in. Now, you, you can study it scientifically, but when you do, you, 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 you're you doing something else. That is, you, you can talk about the history of poetry, you can talk about the... Uh, uh, the background, as they call it, the, uh, the text. The of text, the, you can do a textual poem. criticism. You can talk about the author's lives, you can talk about the psychology of it, you can talk about the sociology of it. But if you, if you want to talk about the thing itself, you have to circle around it, which is what a conversation is. I mean, there's a famous figure of speech uh, that there are three ways of uh, teaching. Now, this had to do with teaching. Uh, there is the way of the falcon. Uh, this is the scientific mode, who is a bird of prey uh, and who swoops in uh, on his, on his, uh, he circles around once or twice, but then he swoops in and seizes it in his beak and flies off with it. And uh, then there is the uh, contemplative way of the eagle, who endlessly from afar uh, circles the sun, they, they, they said. Uh, uh, he, uh, he had no, uh, no prey at all. Uh, he just uh, endlessly circles about in the sky. Uh, circling the sun. And then there's the lowly method of the worm uh, who uh, crawls blindly uh, in, in, in the, through the dark earth uh, and uh, moves forward and stops until he gets familiar with his surroundings. And then he moves his tail up where he is when he feels safe with them. And then he moves a little bit further into the subject, in, into the earth, until he gets familiar with it, 
and then moves up. And uh, a, a conversation is, is, is really a little bit like the worm. Uh, that is, we're not involved in, in contemplation here. We're, we're not dealing with a religious matter. Uh, and neither are we dealing with a scientific matter. We're, we're, we're in, in between. We're doing something much more humble, uh, lowly, something much more like uh, the worm. Uh, a conversation doesn't proceed in any geometric figure at all. It, it isn't a square, and it isn't a circle, it isn't a straight line. Uh, it's, uh, it's a kind of going around the subject, but going around it in an unpredictable uh, way. And the purpose of it is familiarity. The purpose of it is that one would get to know the subject by simply a being. The, uh, I mean, the, the earthworm is such a good figure because uh, the earthworm uh, doesn't see at all. Uh, the falcon and the eagle are famous for their vision. Uh, they, uh, they see things and they see them uh, with great power. Uh, the, uh, the falcon with great uh, accuracy. He has to see it accurately. He sees his prey in order to get it, in order to, uh, to capture it. And the, the eagle uh, is very far-sighted and uh, can see in the, in the light of the sun, that blinding light, uh, is still able to see at great distances. Uh, he can see afar, uh, but the, the worm can't see at all. And the worm goes by, we say, by feel. I don't know what other senses the worm might have, but he goes by feel, and the, uh, the worm is a... The worm does turn. We, we often talk about yes, it. the worm turning and all that. The worm does turn. He, he wiggles. He, he, he but is not geometrically. Not, no, not geometrically. <laughs> he has a sinuous kind of movement through the through the earth. Uh, he wiggles uh, along and, uh, and comes into immediate contact with uh, his own element, uh, the earth, and, and all of the things that are in the earth. Uh, and that kind of immediacy is something that... Uh, you strive for in a conversation. Uh, I think he even eats it, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And he fertilizes it at, at <laughs> yeah. the same time. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a it's a great uh, great figure, and it is it is. Uh, it also uh, the, the other good thing about that figure, among other things, is uh, that it does uh, not place poetry uh, on a par uh, with other uh, with, the, with the sciences. Uh, that is, it, there is a tendency to uh, to try to see poetry. We've talked about this before as some kind of exalted uh, vision to take it away from the earth, um, and uh, and this this is this is very close. The poetry is very close to the earth, very close to the particular, as we've said uh, so many times. Uh, science. Uh, we, we are so uh, used to science and its ways in our times. We're not very much used to the contemplative mode, but we are used to science. And it's science that demands uh, exactitude and precision about uh, data and facts and names and grammar and all of those details and, and, of and discourse. That, that, that uh, objectivity, that kind yes. of absence, yeah. uh, the, the impersonal. Yeah. Uh, um, and you... Uh, the, I was thinking especially about that word precise, that uh, when, you, when you become precise, you also have a way of separating yourself from other aspects of the reality of the thing that you're dealing with. Precision calls for a certain kind of, it does call for a certain kind of vision. Uh, and it means to pre-cut. It means to cut off from something or other, uh, and that is uh, scientific language is like that. I know someone uses the example of death. They say, well, if you if you go to a doctor uh, and you say, uh, you know, is uh, what is death? Uh, he says, well, it's it's uh, you can see it on the graph on the on the brain waves. It's when the, it's when that little line starts stops wiggling. That's then and then he's dead. That we can tell when someone's dead when the line starts wiggling, and and uh, you say, well, that, that's that's a precise way of talking about death, of of determining the moment of death or something of that sort. It aims at precision, at exactly this moment, uh, the line flattened out and the patient died. Uh, but 
if we say, if, if someone says, well, yes, but I, I really want to understand death. I want to know what it means. Well, then the, the scientist says, well, I, I can't tell you about that. All, all I can tell you is about, uh, you know, respiration and, and the heartbeat and, and all of those things that I can measure. And you say, well, there, that isn't very much, really, you have to, you of have to the go reality. You have to go. Uh, then you have to, if you say, you want to know what death is, well, you really, you really ought to listen to the Didn't poem. we say the only subject of poetry is love and war? And the way we put it, <laughs> yes. well, love and death and would death. be another way of putting yeah. it. And again, they turn out to be the same thing. Sure. There's some connection at any rate between them, some yeah. mysterious link. Love is strong as death, it says in the, uh, in the Song of Songs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does the bride say that? That's stronger. It says as strong as death. As strong. Yeah. strong as death. Yeah. 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 And, and links the two uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a relation of, of unity. Uh, you know, just a minute ago, too, you, you, you spoke about how in the very earliest, maybe the very first of these talks, we spoke about the humility of poetry and how it is of the earth, like the earthworm. And then I think a couple of times later, uh, I got soaring up there with John Milton <laughs> in some very exalted uh, poetry about, about poetry. And again, if someone were listening to these uh, talks of ours, they might say, well, for goodness sakes now, isn't that a contradiction? Yeah. Uh, I think I was talking, uh, wasn't it from... Uh, it's about music. It was was about, it? It's at a solemn music. At, at a solemn music. Those, those marvelous lines, uh, you know, all about how music does lift you up and take you up uh, on its wings and all that kind of stuff. And here we are saying, no, 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 you mustn't have that idea. And yet there we were the other day saying, well, yes, you have to have that idea. Uh, well, uh, we're not denying the law of contradiction, but we are not in the mode uh, of contradiction. Uh, it's true uh, that, that poetry does deal with uh, ambiguities, paradoxes, now, what is a paradox, an apparent contradiction, something that seems, when you look at it, uh, to be impossible, something contradictory, and yet uh, it isn't. Uh, one of the favorite poetic figures is called the oxymoron. Uh, Some people say oxymoron, <laughs> and I don't know which is correct. I don't know. But uh, it has to do with deliberately modifying, with an adjective, a noun, that it, that it couldn't possibly go with. It's as if you talked about a solid liquid or uh, 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 something that couldn't possibly be. Uh, and yet you do that on purpose because it moves you into an understanding uh, in the dark, to a dark light. See, there, there, there's one of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and that, of course, uh, uh, gives us this poetic license uh, to, 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 to sometimes jump to figures uh, with, with opposite meanings. Uh, poetry is indeed winged, uh, and it does indeed lift us up and permits us to go up into the heavens, and we can hear the music of the spheres, and then suddenly we say, well, here we are, worms beneath the earth now. now how are you going to get up to the spheres? Well, we don't do that in the same poem. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that in the same figure. Uh, we're talking uh, uh, about different aspects uh, of something that is essentially a mystery. Now, yeah, let, uh, go ahead. I was going to say last time uh, we were talking about the importance of things and how uh, poetry uh, has to do with that concrete, particular thing. Of course, it deals with it philosophically in the sense that. Uh, the poet knows that poetry is a mode of knowledge. It's not simply experience. There is a, a universal in the concrete that he deals with. But nonetheless, uh, the, the mode of the poet is to bind that universal, to incarnate it, uh, as if you, if you wanted to know God, you would know Christ, the man. God who became the man, because that's the only way that we can touch him and, 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 uh, and, and take him into ourselves uh, through that uh, uh, palpable uh, concrete experience.
we call these things sometimes <clears throat> mis mysteries. Uh, we talk about the incarnation as a mystery of the faith. And uh, actually, uh, in the early uh, church fathers, especially the Greek fathers, uh, th th there was a uh, habit of calling, uh, rather identifying uh, paradoxes and mysteries. And, and, and the word sacrament, uh, the sacrament of the altar was often called, given that Greek word, uh, paradox. It's a, uh, there is a uniting in uh, sacraments of something divine and something uh, palpable, something material. Uh, they're, they're both present there, and it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a strange kind of combination. It seems to be a contradiction. It seems to be a contradiction, and it's, it baffles uh, the mind. Um, and I suppose all we're saying is that, uh, is that uh, poetry does deal, we said this before, that poetry does deal with, uh, with the mysteries of human experience, and uh, the mystery probably all I don't uh, probably always involves uh, this union uh, of things not only things disparate and strange uh, when put together but very often things that seem contradictory that is things as far apart as uh, something uh, universal and something uh, something concrete in particular <clears throat> I think we referred last time to a revolution in poetry in our time uh, by Ezra Pound and his followers, among whom was William Carlos Williams. And we had said that, that they had gone too far. Uh, that is, that they had, uh, had denied the universal. Uh, Ezra Pound took up Chinese philosophy, whatever he thought he meant by that. I'm not so sure how much any of us knows uh, about Chinese philosophy anyway. But he took it to mean uh, a, um, a philosophy of nothing but the particular, which is a contradiction in itself. Uh, Pound was very fond of the Chinese language, which, about which he knew very little again. But uh, he, uh, he had read some, some books about it. Uh, and um, he himself uh, uh, wrote quite frequently about its relation to poetry. He said that the Chinese uh, ideogram, the Chinese written language, is, is not based upon concepts, but, uh, but, but little pictures. Uh, the example he gave, and, and, and again, I'm not sure it isn't literal, was that the color red in, in, a, in a Chinese uh, word is represented by a little picture of a brick, a fire engine, and blood. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't remember. Uh, but I remember the fire engine was there, and it struck me that probably the Chinese didn't have fire engines when they, when they invented it. But you, but you see the point. Uh, th that is, uh, the, the Chinese deny that there is such a thing as red. They just say, well, there are red things. And so if you want to uh, uh, communicate that to someone else, you just name a couple of things, and then the person nods and says, oh, yes, I see what you mean. Uh, now, uh, what, what, what do we call that? It has, a, it has a, a name in philosophy, I suppose. Nominalism is the, is the old-fashioned philosophical name. That is, that a word is just a name for a, for a bundle of, uh, of things that are uh, related uh, accident. By accident, yeah. yeah. yeah they're a mere, a mere breath of air, as, yeah. as the nominalists called it. The word is just a breath of air. It's just a bochus flaccus flaccus or something like that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it, uh, it, it, uh, it's, uh, it, it just designates, it's all just a label for, for a, an accidental... The whole Images School of Poetry it was yeah. devoted to that. Instead of writing a poem, they said, well, we'll just say fire engine, blood, brick, and that's a poem. And, and we'll print it, and, and you will look at it, and you'll either get it or you won't. And if you don't, that's fine, because after all, we're only writing about concrete things anyway. The, well, the, Mr. Uh, Senior might have chosen uh, red because 
as this example because the uh, William Carlos Williams most famous poem is, is about the little red wagon that's that's the one that everybody always refers to and it's uh, it's it's I can't remember how it goes how much uh, a little red wagon how much depends upon, depends upon something like that. a little red wagon right. in the rain or something in the sun. Like in the sun. Maybe, maybe, maybe I forget. <laughs> but it doesn't much matter. And what we would say about that is, well, no, really, uh, that's not a poem. Uh, that is, in order to have a, have a poem, you you do have to have an idea. That you do have to have a have, have a, a philosophy. All poets, in that sense, are philosophical poets. Uh, but then, of course, on the other hand, we have a category. A philosophical poets with a big capital PH uh, and then we go to the opposite extreme of, of poets who lose this. Williams in one of his poems uh, has a line, no truth but in things. Well uh, again uh, there's a truth in that. Uh, we, 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 we have to stop and, and reflect on it. Uh, uh, Actually, St. Thomas would say, well, be careful of a statement like that. Uh, there isn't any truth in the thing. Uh, truth is a relation of the mind to thing. Uh, without a mind, uh, there isn't any truth. Uh, you might argue uh, that there is a relation between the mind of God and the thing uh, and, uh, uh, and leave out our perception of it. But you still couldn't say, no truth but in things. Now, that's impossible. Uh, truth is a relation that holds between uh, the mind and, and the thing. Now, uh, to that extent, therefore, all poetry uh, must be philosophical. Anything human must be philosophical. Well, uh, let, let's move a, a step up uh, from this, uh, uh, or a step closer to the poem, I should say. You remember last time we, uh, we, we read aloud rather haphazardly, I, I think, I just opened the book and came on a passage. I, I didn't deliberately uh, search for it, uh, but it, it was a good one, and it illustrated this, this, this marvelous sense of the thing uh, that Homer has. You remember uh, uh, the landing of the ship uh, in the harbor on the island of Chrysi when Odysseus brings the hecatomb, uh, the, uh, the sacrificial offering, uh, to, uh, to Apollo. And how Homer moves into those concrete details of the of the deep harbor <clears throat> and the hawser, the, the great cable of the ship, and how they moor it up on the beach. Every single one of those details is like a movie. It's photographed in close up. Uh, and, 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 and some people would say, well, why does he bother with all that? Oh, the answer is, he's just trying to sketch in the background for you so that he can get on with the tale. Oh, no, oh, no, no, that, that's not true. Uh, in, 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 sometimes you wonder whether the tale is written just in order that he might talk about harbors. You know, we, 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 we sometimes uh, almost get into the point of reversing uh, the order there. However, I don't think we ought to reverse the order. <clears throat> that is, there's something else wrong with that statement, no truth but in things. It's, it's, it's bothered me for years. You know how, and in, uh, in, in, in this happens to us, uh, I was um, 40 years ago, I think, in an argument with somebody, and he quoted that line and completely demolished me in the argument, and I never got over it. And I've always thought, well, there must be an answer. There must be a way out of that. Uh, and here it is 40 years later, I think, uh, I've thought about what's wrong with that, but I couldn't think of it at the time. But he, but, uh, but he's left out people. Uh, why don't we say that there's truth in persons and things? Because uh, there is a poetry, and it's a poetry of a high order, but it's not the highest order. That is, there is a poetry that deals with things, but we miss. Um, we miss the people. Uh, even even such a, uh, a great poet as Wordsworth, let's say, uh, when we compare him to Chaucer or Shakespeare, uh, we, we say, well, he's, he's not that great. Uh, Wordsworth had a great love of uh, mountains and, and uh, uh, woods and birds, and, uh, but 
there are no people except except the poet I suppose yeah, he's, and he's the observer, observer. Uh, really uh, yeah uh, but gee when you pick up a, a page of Homer uh, the mountains are there the sea is there the harbors and the horses but they're all related to human beings that, that is uh, they're not wild nature uh, maybe Wordsworth uh, isn't even the, uh, the proper example Shelley perhaps carries this to the extreme mm -hmm. where you get endless pages of description of mountains in the Alps uh, with glaciers and, and there isn't a human being anywhere there and, and that's wonder that's what Shelley likes about it uh, you, you cannot pick up a page of Homer that isn't uh, Dante has a phrase, isn't it? Trans, transhumanized, <laughs> transhumanized. Uh, that is, uh, uh, Mount Olympus is not a, a glacier, <laughs> but Mount Olympus is a is a is a, uh, is a is a is a homely place. Uh, get back to somehow the worm is up there. I don't know how he got up there. But it's peopled, people, people, people. Uh, place. When we. Um, uh, Thomas Hardy uh, has a line uh, uh, where he says that the mists of the mountains are beautiful, but they're not as important. Now, how did that line go? As the um, the worn threshold. I think that's how it goes. The, the worn threshold and the. Oh no, I can't quote it. I thought I had that right in my memory. And he and he speaks about a. Uh, print of a human hand. Mm -hmm. I think it is the, war, the worn threshold of the human. The print of a hand. And he's thinking, I think, about a cottage. Yes, yes, I think I know what you know. Do you know, do you know that poem? poem uh, but it's typical of Thomas Hardy, you know. Yes. And it, and it and it's very homely, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's true. That now that's really true. Uh, he, how the uh, the feet of the people who have lived in that house, uh, stepping over the threshold of that door. Have, have worn it down, and, and uh, when when the poet comes along, he sees that threshold. He doesn't just see the mists and the mountains and the birds. God knows he does. <laughs> he does see those things, but but his eye always comes back to the to the person who's there, uh, listening to the bird, or or watching the mountain, or to whom the mist uh, means something because. Uh, his lover didn't appear uh, in this, uh, or or whatever or whatever it was. That that human quality. Uh, Homer is uh, well. He just does both of those things all the time. I mentioned the Iphibus just out of the, out of nowhere, out of the blue, and uh, at the very end of this poem, when the whole thing is over. Hector has been killed. A single combat has taken place. And the old man gets it into his head, old Priam, that he's going to get back the body of his son. I guess a goddess puts it into his mind. And, uh, there's a, and, he, and, he, and he, he's an old man and he's filled with wrath, with an old man's anger, because it's ineffectual. He has no strength left. But, but what Homer says, he drave all the Trojans from out the portico and chid them with words of reviling. I love those words, drave and chid. That's old-fashioned language, of course. Get ye hence, wretches, ye that work me shame. And he spake, and plying his staff, went among the men. And they went forth from before the old man in his haste. He was beating them with his stick. And then he called aloud to his sons, chiding Helenus and Paris and goodly Agathon and Pamon and Antiphonus and Polites, good at the war cry, and Deiphobus and Apophobus and lordly Dios. To these Nine, the old man called aloud and gave command. Haste ye, base children that are my shame. Would that ye all together in Hector's stead had been slain at the swift ships. 
I mean, I'd like to read this whole passage, but maybe we just should stop right there. there there's day for us. And he's saying, would that you had been killed. Imagine if, you're, if your father said that to you. Uh, Aethelbus is, is one of the younger sons. Uh, he's, he's all, I, I suppose, an adolescent, uh, as, as he's pictured in the, in the whole, throughout the whole poem. He's, he's full of courage, uh, but, he, but he's, not, uh, he's not as great as Hector. He's not a great warrior yet. He got wounded uh, uh, earlier on in the poem in the shoulder. Uh, he, he fought very courageously. He shed his blood. But, but here is, is his father. I wonder why they're nine. You know, you wonder about these nine. He, he picks out these nine. Because there are many other sons. Uh, there are fifty. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, fifty sons and fifty daughters. Yes. Yeah. A hundred children, that's right. Heck, a hundred children. But, but there must be some reason for that. And again, we're, we're just lowly worms. We don't know why there are nine. But, but the minute you use the number nine, you, you know that, it, that it's very significant. And that's a serious number. And uh, he says, would you, would you have been slain at the Swiss ships? Woe is me that I'm all unblessed, seeing that I begat sons, the best in the broad land of Troy. Yet of them I avow that not one is left. Not godlike, Mester, not Troilus. And of course, we stop there and we always think about the future of Troilus. How <laughs> Chaucer wrote a whole poem about him. The warrior charioteer, not Hector, that was a god among men. Neither seemed he as the son of a mortal, but of a god. All them hath Ares slain. Yet these things of shame are left me. He calls them things. Now again, I, I don't know how that would come in the Greek, but, but he says of his sons, all of them, the good ones, have been slain, yet these things of shame, see there's the distinction between persons and things, are left me. False of tongue, nimble of foot, peerless at beating the floor in the dance, <laughs> robbers of lambs and kids from your own folk, will ye not make me ready a wagon? See, they've been trying to stop the old man from this foolish venture. He, he's going to take uh, some gifts and go to Achilles and, and, and beg for the return of the corpse of his son. And they say, well, well you'll never get there. Some, some Greek sentry will kill you and, and steal the gifts. Or if you do get there, I mean, think of Achilles. He killed Hector. He hates you. You'll never come back alive. And so they do everything they can to stop him, but nothing can stop him. Will he not make me ready a wagon? And that with speed, so spake he, and they seized with fear of the rebuke of their father, brought forth the light running wagon, drawn of mules, fair and newly wrought, and bound upon it the wicker box. And down from its peg they took the mule yoke, a boxwood yoke, with a knob thereon, well fitted with guiding rings. And they brought forth the yoke band with nine cubits, and therewithal the yoke. The yoke they set with care upon the polished pole at the upturned end thereof, and cast the ring upon the fold, and they bound it fast to the knob with three turns to the left and right, and thereafter made it fast to the post, and bent the hook there under. Well, that illustrates everything, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, uh, the wrath of that old man, that terrible rebuke of his sons, poor Deiphobus, who, who flees. There's piety, of course. They, they could have knocked the staff from the old man's hand, but they, but they run in, in fear from him. That's a perfect example of what we call filial Beer. <laughs> Filial. Beer. It is. It's, com it's a comic example almost, you know, and yet it is. Yeah, it's very serious. But then, if you measured this with a, with a ruler, 50% uh, of that passage is about the wagon. Uh, I mean, why, why are we told about this fair, 
newly wrought wine. Everything depends upon wine. <laughs> <laughs> See, it does. I mean, there, there is a truth in in that line of, 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 of Williams, and, and a truth in, in that little poem. Uh, but the wagon and the wicker box, and then he goes into the to the kind of wood it's made out of, and and to the way the rings and the the reins fit through the to the guiding rings. Go, goes into all those details, so that. You'll never forget that wagon as long as you live. But why is it that you won't forget it? Well, it's because it's so bound into this terrible story. Uh, you, you, you see, this is at the end of the whole poem. And you go back over the, the thing that's haunting you is the death of Hector. And that Hector's body is going to be brought back uh, on that way. Uh, just a minute later Hecuba comes in and he described her as sore stricken bearing in her right hand honey hearted wine and a cup of gold that they might make a libation ere they left so when we were brought back to this human thing uh, this humus this earth uh, and to the essential sadness of it. Uh, all poems are about death. Absolutely. We, we said they're all about love, but they're all about death. Uh, the love is, uh, is always lost. <clears throat> Otherwise, there isn't any poem. There's that, that love of, uh, of Priam for his, uh, for, for Hector, uh, and the love of, of uh, these sons of his, uh, whom he is reviling, <laughs> there is their love uh, for, uh, for him. Uh, for him and for Hector. And for uh, Hector, of course. Uh, uh, Deiphobus, you know, I, I spent some time looking looking this up, I didn't remember yeah, all I've forgotten things. all of this. Right. But you know, um, when Hector is fighting in single combat with Achilles. Uh, he faces up to him. They are the two greatest warriors in the world together. And uh, Hector's sword breaks, and he's left without a weapon. And uh, Achilles, of course, draws his, and he's going to kill him. And at that instant, Hector flees. It, it's, it's the most terrifying moment in the world, in the history of warfare. This great man, this man of, who is courage itself, honor itself, the democratic perfection of, of, of a man, uh, suddenly has this moment of complete loss. He, he, he's stricken with terror and he runs. And Achilles chases him on the ignominy of that. And they're all watching up there on the uh, on, the, on the battlements of Troy. Pursues him around the walls of Troy oh, itself. And then as he runs, he finally he comes to his senses and he stops. And he turns. And standing uh, near him is Deiphorus, who brings him a sword. And he says, Deiphorus, who loved him most, well, it turns out to be false. It's a hallucination to trick of the gods. They do that. Uh, and it isn't Aphobus at all. It's, uh, it's Athena, I think. Uh, one, of, one of the gods, anyway. Uh, in the guise of Aphobus, uh, calls to him and says, uh, Stop, I'll, I'll, I have another sword for you. I'll get you another weapon. And that's why he stops. And he says, Oh, Deiphobus, my beloved brother. You know, that, that's so wonderful, that the young brother who, who has the courage you know, to come out there and bring the sword. Well, that, he's the only brother who would have fooled him. He's the only one that uh, Hector would have believed. That's why the goddess was so clever to, to have chosen that disguise. But then he has to, of course, turn and be killed. And he, and he is. He, he, then he just walks courageously, really, to his, to his death. But, uh, but it is Deiphobus who was, who was the one at that moment uh, that the gods chose. And, and here we are at the end of the poem, and, and old Priam is calling him a thing, a thing of shame. You know, what he means is 
that anybody alive at this moment should be ashamed of himself because Hector is dead. That's commonly said, isn't it, in, uh, in war poems, that uh, those of us who survive uh, are, are, are ashamed because the best of us have died. It's especially true of the uh, of the of the defeated, uh, yes. the, the Trojans who, who have lost. Uh, that uh, they uh, they are ashamed to uh, to go on living, and would rather be rather be uh, dead. Uh, later on, when you get to to Virgil, uh, he he feels this very keenly. Virgil is the one, of course, who escapes. Uh, from the ruin of Troy, and, and how often he says, uh, "Oh, I, I wish I could have died there uh, with with my people. I would have done so had not the gods absolutely uh, forbade me to do so." And it's another thing. Poems are about love, and poems are about war, and poems are about death. Poems are always about the losing side, somehow. That is the. Uh, this is called the Iliad. It's not called the, uh, I don't know what it would be. Uh, the Achilliad. The Achilliad, or the, yeah, the Achilliad. Or the Olympiad, or the, what, what, the, the Greekiad, Greekiad. Uh, it's called the Iliad, and it really is about the fall of Troy. And everyone thinks, ah, the fall of Troy. Actually, the fall doesn't take place in this poem, but, it, but we know that, that now they haven't got a chance without Hector. And with so many of his sons killed, uh, it's only a matter of uh, some time, and it turns out to be, of course, a stratagem. Uh, a lot of people think that the Trojan horse is somehow part of the Iliad, but it's not. It, 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 none of that happened yet. But uh, it's a greater poem for all of that, uh, because um, it's about the meaning of things rather than simply the events of things. But the Trojan War is essentially over the day that Achilles killed Hector. And Hector knows uh, long before he faces Achilles that his days are numbered. He knows uh, that he is going to his death. Uh, the, uh, one of the very great scenes in this poem is, is uh, Hector's farewell to Andromache. It occurs quite early on in the poem, actually. I'm always, uh, I always have trouble finding it because I have the idea that it takes place late in the poem. It doesn't really take place so late. Where is it? As far all. as back as book eight, or I can't. I can't remember. remember I'll myself. never find it because I don't have a. I always have trouble finding more, it. Uh, a more tradition, but that is, of course. Well, let's just talk about it because I don't think I can find it. Either. Sure, I don't think I can either. Um, I mean, anybody you see who is a professor. Of literature, we would know that. With, uh, as he, in, which, to, in which book does that occur? <laughs> Any, anybody should should know that. We've been teaching hey, this poem for 20 years. And yeah, we, many people can tell you the line numbers. You know, they can say <laughs> that's book seven, lines 253 to seven. They're like they're like people who know the Bible uh, by chapter and verse, um, and uh, we we really don't know it in that way. Um, the uh, but she, um, it, it's, it's the point at which uh, Andromache, uh, Hector's wife, attempts to uh, persuade him to, uh, to avoid a fight with Achilles. And it doesn't occur just before the battle uh, with Achilles at all, as I recall. I mean, he does go out and he, and he does return. It's, it's in book, uh, it's in... I, I thought it was eight, but that's not... It's in book six. Six, even book earlier. Six. Yes, nine, it's even, nine, even nine. earlier than that. Yeah, yeah, sure, here it is, yeah. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, she knows uh, that, that he's going to his death if he fights Achilles, and he knows that he's going to his death. Uh, he's the greatest of all the Trojans, but uh, he knows that he is not... Uh, to defeating Achilles. Now, of course, Achilles, uh, Achilles is out of the fight uh, at the present time, um, and uh, the, whole, the whole question of the first part of this book is how Achilles can be brought back into the, into the war. Uh, and uh, the only thing that will bring him back is uh, love 
and death. Uh, it's, it's his love of uh, Patroclus, uh, his, uh, his lifelong friend, uh, and uh, the death of Patroclus. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's the only thing uh, that could possibly overcome the, uh, the uh, uh, shame uh, that he has suffered as a result of the insult uh, put upon him uh, at the beginning of the poem is the is the death of Patroclus, and that uh, that leads him back into the war. And then uh, I think everyone knows on both sides that uh, that the whole that uh, that Troy is doomed. Uh, that that sense of doom hangs over Troy from the very beginning of the poem. But there is a moment. Uh, when it seems that uh, perhaps the, the whole thing might turn around and go the other way because, uh, because Achilles withdraws. Uh, everything uh, depends upon Achilles. How much, how much depends on Achilles? Well, everything depends on Achilles. Uh, That's a sign, isn't it, of a democratic world, too? <clears throat> that everything depends upon persons, not upon things. Yes. Uh, it's not upon organization or armaments or uh, economics or we, strategies. We used to say uh, during World War II, what was the slogan? Um, something yeah. will win the war. Uh, it wasn't factories, but it was uh, something will win the war. Darn it, now I can't remember the slogan, but it was things. Mm -hmm. That is armaments. So the idea was uh, that the factories of America would uh, win the war. And they did. Yeah, well, it was that kind of a war. It wasn't a democratic war. Um, the, uh, in fact, uh, those uh, those kinds of wars of, uh, of the things over men, the the things tend to triumph, uh, and the men tend to lose. The uh, uh, the, uh, the 